let me ask you to uh, welcome again Dr. Christensen. Well, good morning. I uh, glad to see you all here. I uh, hope you all slept well. And uh, I'm going to follow up what I talked about last night with um, actually stepping back. Last night I talked about emerging adulthood, 18 to 29, with a special focus on 18 to 23. Today's talk is going to is really going to focus more on what came out of some of my research when the same group of people were teenagers. So I'm going to go back to teenage faith. But what I'm going to say today also applies to very many emerging adults. Um, so again, this all comes out of my National Study of Youth and Religion, but I am going to assume, uh, last night I explained the National Study of Youth and Religion, our data collection method, our evidence we have. Uh, I'm going to assume that almost all of you were here last night, so I don't need to repeat that and just save that time and not bore you with that. So I just want to get right on to talking some about the religious and spiritual lives of American teenagers. First, I want to give some broad overview sort of observation about the kind of the context of teenagers' religious lives, and then I want to zero in on this moralistic therapeutic deism idea. To start off, we can observe that about a third of teenagers are regularly religious invol religiously involved. And by teenagers here, I mean 13 to 17 or 18. About a third are sporadically religiously involved. They are religiously involved, but not so much. Um, just somewhat. And about a third are not at all religiously involved. So that's kind of the big picture. Um, the intensity of teen religiosity varies greatly by religious tradition. The most religious, at least according to sociological measures, are Mormon, Latter-day Saints. Then white conservative Protestants are almost as religious. Black Protestants are pretty religious. Mainline Protestant teenagers start to become somewhat less religious. Catholic teenagers are even less religious than that, according to sociological measures. Jewish teenagers, but Jewish teenage, Ju Judaism is, a, is a, di a more difficult comparison to make with sociological measures, so I sort of take that with a grain of salt, and then the least religious or non-religious. So depending on what tradition a teenager is a part of will help to determine uh, if they are more or less religiously active, believing, and invested. Most U.S. teenagers are not religious rebels alienated from or disgruntled with the churches in which they were raised. A lot of baby boomers, older people have a, still carry with them a sense of sort of a generation gap or a hostility to authorities and so on. But teenagers today and recently are not really like that. They're pretty much bought into the mainstream culture and institutions and more or less want to succeed and, uh, and prosper within them. But neither does religious faith and practice mean a heck of a lot to most teens either or connect much to the rest of their lives. So there's not an opposition, but there's also not a great investment. The majority of American teenagers are in fact exceedingly conventional in their religious identities and practice. Sort of however they were raised, they go along with to a certain degree. They're not like, kicking up a fuss about it. If you ask them if they're interested in other religions or exploring other spiritualities, they're pretty much like, why would I do that? I mean, this is what I am, this is how I was raised. Religion is not particularly contested or conflictive as an aspect of most youth's lives, but is generally viewed, viewed in a benignly positive light. Right. Thought of as well, it's a nice thing, it's a good thing for many people. It's nothing to be worked up about. The majority of American teens consider religion to be good and say that it is important. They accept it as kind of a taken for granted aspect or presence that operates in the background of their lives. It's sort of like the furniture in their house. It's just what's always been there and they don't really pay lots of attention to it. They know it's there and it's probably a good thing, but there's little recognition of the influence, importance, or its, dis or its distinction in their life. In the ecology of American adolescence lives, religious faith operates in a social structurally weak position competing for time, energy, and attention, and often losing against more dominant demands and commitments of school, sports, television, and other media. So if you think of teenagers as bundles of time, energy, and attention that different institutions or interests are trying to get some of, uh, school's trying to get some, the media's trying to get some, uh, work's trying to get some, homework, sports, whatever, 
Um, the religious part of most teenagers' lives gets just a little tiny piece of it, sort of sits at the far end of the corner of the table, so to speak, maybe gets an hour a week or so out of a teenager as far as their time and attention. Now, that does not position religious faith uh, in a strong way to sort of really be a formative influence unless the parents and the family religion is important and all around then religion can sort of have more of an influence on teenagers lives mediated through home life but otherwise um, it's in a social structurally weak position nearly all American youth like American adults are profoundly individualistic when it comes to religion, instinctively presuming an autonomous individual self-direction to be the universal norm and goal. Everyone is like a little atom that's sort of living their life and completely directing themselves. And individualism is not a contested orthodoxy, it's just a taken for granted, invisible and pervasive assumption. Most American youth bring strong life course assumptions and scripts to religion and to many other things in life, viewing its relevance in terms of age-appropriate stages. So religion isn't viewed, or religious faith, or involvement in church isn't viewed as a sort of holistic, transcendent uh, authority or, or experience that makes claims on one's life and forms all aspects of one's life. It's more like, well, at certain stages you do different things and you get those over with and then you move on to other things. And so for teenagers, there's, you know, you go to church, you do what your family asks you to do, but for most, it's just um, something you're doing at a certain time in life. And especially for teenagers, the idea is that it's okay to be somewhat religious, but it's important not to be too religious. Now, the teenagers we talked to were continually referred to kids in their schools that were too religious, and they thought that that was a problem. They, some of them actually had a sense that being too religious was almost morally wrong. That uh, kind of freaked them out. And so it's all right if you sit moderately religious, but don't be too religious. Relatively few teens are practicing their faith. That is not just generally living it out, but practicing like they practice sports or swimming or tennis or music, piano, guitar, uh, etc. That is, we, we know if anyone wants to learn anything, they have to practice it. And this is true of religious practices. You have to do it to learn sort of a, a more excellent way in prayer or hospitality or whatever it is. But not many teenagers are actually practicing their faith. faith most teens say they pray. Very few read the Bible, and only the most committed and serious engage in other religious practices. American youth, like many adults, tend to assume an instrumental view of religion. That is, religion is a tool that you use to do something. It's not something that sort of takes, that forms you. You're, it's something that you use. Instinctively supposing that religion exists to help individuals be and do what they want. Religion is not viewed generally as an external transcendent authority that makes claims or demands on people's lives, especially to change or grow in ways they may not want to. For most American youth, religion bears a close but ambivalent relationship with morality. Religion, if you were here last night, you remember me talking about re religion as moralism. Religion is thought of as fostering morality, but not also not necessary for morality. So, in other words, the, the idea here is re what religion specializes in is making people good, good, making them live better. But you don't need religion for that. There are non-religious people who are good and there are religious people who are not good. So the, essentially the one thing that religion specializes in is not necessary to have. So it's sort of an optional life. In the logic of it makes religion sort of an optional lifestyle accoutrement. And very many youth will say, I don't need that to be a good person. And if it's assumed being a good person is the only thing religion exists there for, then religion is take it or leave it. And as I said last night, the bar on morality is set very low, so religion is there to help um, people be good, but it doesn't take too much to be good. You just can't be a completely rotten person. The vast majority of us, which means religion isn't in charge of anything necessary or, or, you know, or crucial. The vast majority of American teenagers are incredibly inarticulate about their faith, their religious beliefs and practices, and the meaning of place in their lives. They just have a hard time talking about it. They ha haven't been given a lot of practice to talk about it. 
For many teens we interviewed, it seemed as if ours was the first time any adult had ever asked them what they believed. Some of them actually said that. We would ask them, so do you have any sort of religious beliefs at all? And I'd say, I don't know, but he's ever asked me that before. I don't know. I'll have to think about it. Um, by contrast, they could be very articulate about other subjects that they've been drilled on, that, in, that adult institutions have told them, you should think about this and you should talk about it, like STDs and tolerance of difference and so on. Now, some people think that um, this inarticulacy among teenagers that we detect is just a matter of psychological developmental stages, but we really don't believe that because older teens and older emerging adults later were not more articulate in their faith than younger teens. Teens of any age could be fairly articulate on subjects about which they'd learn to think and discuss. So really we think this is uh, the most obvious difference reflects the effect of intentional religious socialization. Kids of any age, at any stage in life, who've had opportunity to learn and to learn how to talk about and to think through religious matters could do it. And kids of any age, and adults of any age who haven't, can't. It's pretty straightforward that way. Nearly all American teenagers seem to have adopted a posture of civility and a careful and ambiguous inclusiveness and tolerance when discussing religion with possible others. There's a definite sort of be nice, make sure you don't step on anybody's toes, don't take a definite stand on anything, be very careful in negotiating conversations so that nothing gets upset. What most U.S. teens, and even with a social scientist that, said, that explains very explicitly, nothing you say is going to offend me, I've heard it all, we just want to know whatever the truth is. Even then, they're a little, try to be careful. Most U.S. teens will talk about God or being good or religion's benefits. That's not a problem. Some teens will talk about the personal importance of faith in their life or church, praying or doing bad things. Almost no U.S. teens seem able or willing to talk about things like God's love or Jesus or grace or discipleship or anything more particular particular or more demanding, something that might upset somebody. Um, the majority of American youth, however, now I get to the main thesis that I want to argue here, and no doubt many adults, and not only no doubt, I've interviewed a lot of adults, especially with this in mind since then, and have heard it straightforwardly, are functional de facto moralistic therapeutic deists. Now this, uh, the, I, I put together this idea of moralistic therapeutic deism from listening to teenagers and I went through the summer of interviewing lots and lots of teenagers in 2003 and it just gradually kept dawning on me, dawning on me um, first of all, their religion is completely moralistic, it's just be good it's really what it boils down to. They're not Trinitarian. Even the evangelical one, very few of them are Trinitarian. They could not think or talk or reference the Trinity. It was all just God, just this sort of monotheistic God. So I thought, they're not Christians. They're actually deists. The way, and the way God functions seemed more like deism. God is way at a far distance. And then the therapeutic part came in, as I'll explain, I thought, yeah, but they do view God as sort of solving their problems and helping them out. So then I formulated the real religion that's running here, even though they don't know it in exactly these terms, is moralistic therapeutic deism. And so here's the creed of MTD. A God exists who created and orders the world and watches over human life on Earth. So it is theistic, it's creational, and it has this sort of deist, God provide, God creates things, sets it in motion, and provides a moral law. God want, What does God want? God wants people to be good, nice, and fair to each other. That's what the Bible teaches as far as they're concerned, and that's what all or most world religions teach. You just be good to other people, you'd be nice, you'd be fair. The purpose of life is to be happy and to feel good about oneself. That's what life is all about, <coughs> ultimately. God does not need to be particularly involved in one's life except when he's needed to resolve a problem. So God sort of stays, God's up far away unless you call upon God to fix a problem for you. And good people go to heaven when they die. And again, nearly everybody's good. So there isn't really a need for salvation here or redemption. It's just God set things up. You don't be a complete jerk and you'll go to heaven. And in the meanwhile, uh... God will help you sort of through your difficult times. 
Now, no youth would actually use the terminology moralistic therapeutic deist to describe themselves. Obviously, this is my summarizing term. And very few youth would lay out the five points of its creed as clearly as I just did. They don't sit down and say, here's my, here's my creed. But when, again, when you digest hundreds of discussions with youth, about religion, God, and faith. This is what seems to be emerge, emerge as the dominant de facto. It's not, it's not official, it's tacit. It's not, it's not declared, it's just functional, it's de facto. Viewpoint turns out to be some kind of MTD. So let me unpack this a little bit. First, MTD is about inculcating a moralistic approach to life. It believes that being, uh, that, that central to living a good and happy life is being a good moral person. And so it really is oriented toward you should live pretty good, uh, which is a lot better than some options out there. So if I had to choose in the whole range of religions that young people might believe, MTD isn't among the worst of them. I'll take this over neo-Nazism or something like that. But, um, and this means being nice, kind, pleasant, respectful, responsible at work on self-improvement, taking care of one's health and doing one's best to be successful, being a person that other people will like, fulfilling one's personal potential, and not being socially disruptive or interpersonally obnoxious. Now, this is important to be this in life. So I'm going to quote a variety of kinds of teenagers, 17-year-old white Mormon boy. Well, I believe in well. My whole religion is where you try to be good, and uh, if you're not good, then you should just try to get better. That's all. 16-year-old black conservative Protestant girl from Pennsylvania. Being a Christian means um, don't do many sins, read the Bible, go to church, living godly. That's about it. It's basically not committing sin, basically. If you do the right thing and don't do anything bad, I mean nothing really bad, you know you'll go to heaven. If you don't, then you're screwed. That's about it. Religion supplies the useful guidance in being the good people teens think it's important to be. So if you're supposed to be good or pretty good, religion helps you a lot in that. Religion makes me a better person, it teaches me how to be a good Jew, you know, go out and be a good person, moral. It just makes me a nicer person because before I hated adults, but now it's a lot easier to be like loving and caring to people. Second, moralistic the uh, the uh, MTD is about providing therapeutic benefits to adherence. This is not a religion of repentance from sin or of asking in God's love and grace or spending oneself for social justice or living as God's servant or steadfastly saying prayers or building character or virtues through suffering. This is not that kind of religion. Rather, it's essentially about feeling good, happy, secure, and at peace, attaining subjective well-being, being able to resolve problems and getting along amiably with other people. That is the good that this religion accomplishes for people. So this is partly why teenagers who really believe this, that this all works, um, are positive about religion because it helps them. It helps them to cope, it helps them to get along, etc., etc. So now I'm focusing on the therapeutic texture or character of MTD. And by therapeutic, I don't mean some people need to go to therapy, or a lot of people need to go to therapy. I, that's great. I believe in that. I mean therapeutic in the sense of a whole cultural orientation is toward feeling good and being happy and feeling satisfied. But that's sort of like what all of life is about. So you can pick up some of the language of therapeutic culture in some of what teenagers say. God is like someone who's always there for you. I don't know, just like somebody who will always help you go through whatever you're going through. Now, again, a lot of this I'm not saying from a Christian point of view is wrong. Of course God helps you. But there's a different, there's a different sense when that's the only thing God is about is just taking care of you, helping you, right? So there's subtle differences here. When I became a Christian, I was just praying, and it always made me feel better. I guess for me, Judaism is more about how you live your life. Part of the guidelines are like how to live, and I guess be happy with who you are, because if you're out there helping someone, you're going to feel good about yourself, you know? So the rationale for helping somebody, ultimately here, at least it comes off, is because it makes you feel good about you. That's why one should help another person. Religion is very important um, because when you have no one else to talk to about your stuff, you can just get it off your chest. You 
you talk to God, it's good. So again, this therapy, like you go into God, the therapist, and sort of get things off your chest, and it helps you to cope, and so on. I don't know, faith just really helps me feel good. Here's an exchange with a 14-year-old white conservative Protestant girl I interviewed in Idaho. When you think about God, what image do you have of God? Yawning. Well, what is God like? Um, good. Powerful. Okay, anything else? Tall. Tall? Big. Well, do you think God is active in people's lives or not? Uh, I don't know. This is, the, this is the careful civility of not saying anything too definite, so to keep everything open and sort of skirt around anything that might be wrong. You're not sure? Different people have different views of him. Again, more of the same. What about your view? What do you mean? Do you think God is active in your life? In my life? Yeah. Yeah? Hmm. Well, would you say you feel close to God or not really? Yeah, I feel close. Yawns. Where do you get your ideas about God? The Bible, my mom, church, experience. What kind of experience? He's just done a lot of good in my life, so. Like, what are examples of that? I don't know. Well, I'd love to hear what good has God done in your life. I, well, I have a house, parents, I have the internet, I have phone, and I, ha and I have cable. So, uh, now, it's easy to make fun of this because it's not exactly sophisticated theologically, but part of the message of, the, of our whole project is teenager, it's, we have to get rid of the idea that young people these days are something wrong with them and if only they would be like us adults or the adult world. What we really need to get as a teenagers are like barometers or telltale signs of what's going on in the larger adult world into which they're being socialized. They're learning this stuff from somewhere. Religion provides feelings of mental and psychological security for teenagers all over the place. This is quote after quote. Praying just makes me feel more secure, like there's something there helping me out. If I do religious practices, I'll be blessed. Praying is a way to get something out of. If you want to say, go ahead. If you feel sorry, forgiveness in that kind, it's reassuring. Uh, it's always there mentally to help make things okay. If you don't live a godly life, you'll always be thinking about negative things. Positive beliefs are important. Without my religious beliefs, I wouldn't accept the world or people for who they are. I wouldn't tolerate or accept them. We have a better day when we have family prayer. We just come home in a better attitude and atmosphere. And many youth report one of religion's mental and emotional benefits is helping them keep a good perspective on life. So they'll say things like, it helps me to relax and remember all the things that are important, helps me to see life clearly, gives me a balanced outlook, gives you time to think about uh, what's important that's going on and focus on. Uh, religion helps youth get through their problems and troubles. It helps me get through trying times. It's important when I need God to comfort me. It helps me get through a bad day. If I have a problem, I'll pray. You can do anything with through Christ. It's true, and it'll make a way for your turn a bad day into a good day. It affects your day-to-day, etc. This is just endless quotes from our interviews about how religion makes you feel good or s solves your problems. Some of you suggest that religions help them to be successful and healthier, so some of them say things like, I would say prayer is an essential part of my success, or if I need something I can just pray, or ever since I've been praying we've been eating healthier and I haven't been getting hurt as much. But one of you as adolescents' highest compliments to religion and faith is simply that they help youth to feel good and be happy. And there are endless quotes in our uh, research interviews that religion just makes me feel good, makes me feel happy, makes me feel better, uh, makes me feel positive. Going to church makes me feel better, like if I go in angry when I come out, I'm really happy, etc. I'm not going to read through all these, but there's just tons of these kind of quotes. So here's a non-religious white girl, and part of my claim is that MTD is, the, is a trans-religious, trans-denominational faith, not just of religious kids, but even lots of non-religious kids are actually moralistic therapeutic deists. Moral plays a large part in religion. Morals are good if they're healthy for society, like Christianity, the values you get from like the Ten Commandments. I think every religion is important in its own respect. You know, if you're Muslim, then Islam is the way for you. If you're Jewish, well, that's great too. So in here, you notice there's both the, the, the justification for religion is its functional good for society. That's the first thing. And the second thing is the sort of the relativism. Whatever you want to believe is fine. If you're Christian, well, good for you. It's just whatever makes you feel good about you. And that's what it's all about. 
finally, moralistic therapeutic deism is about belief in a particular kind of mostly distant God, one who exists, who created the world and defines our general moral order, but who's not particularly involved in one's affairs, especially affairs in which one would prefer not to have got involved. Most of the time, the God of this faith keeps a safe distance. For many teens, they describe God as sort of out there, far away, watching over everything from above. Um, it reminds me of this song from, I don't know when, the 80s or something. In a distance, God is watching, God is watching us from a distance or something like that. And uh, um, so they'll say, you know, God is the creator of everything and he's just up there controlling everything. Some teens would use the metaphor of God is like the producer of a Broadway play. And he sits up in the back row of the balcony and just lets everyone do their job mostly keeps quiet and just oversees it. If something's really going wrong, God will sort of come down, straighten things out, and then go back up and keep watching. Look at the model of things. Note the deism here is a revised version of classical 18th century deism. This is not Thomas Jefferson's deism exactly. Revised by the therapeutic qualifier, making the normally distant God selectively available for taking care of personal needs. So, 14 year old white mainline Protestant boy from Colorado, I believe there's a God. So, sometimes when I'm in trouble or danger, then I'll start to think about that. But obviously, if I'm not in trouble or danger, then I'm not thinking about that. Is sort of the analog to that. The de- uh, like the deist uh, god of the 18th century, philosophers, god of contemporary MTD is primarily a divine creator and lawgiver. That's God's job. He designed the universe and established moral law and order, but this God is not Trinitarian, did not speak through the Torah or the prophets of Israel, was never resurrected from the dead, and does not fill and transform people through his Holy Spirit. The moralistic therapeutic deist God is not demanding, he can't be, since his job is to solve problems and make people feel better. God in this faith is something like a combination divine butler and cosmic therapist. That's the job of God here. Always on call to take care of problems. Professionally helps people feel better about themselves and does not become too personally involved in the process. So when you need to, you can call God in, take care of things, get the coats hung up, or feel, and then go away. 14-year-old white <coughs> Catholic boy from Pennsylvania in response to an inquiry about why does religion matter? Well, God made us, and if you ask him for something, I believe he gives it to you. Yeah, he hasn't let me down yet. So what is God like? God is a spirit that grants you anything you want, but not anything bad. Now, I don't know that God grants us anything we want, but I do think in some theological sense, God doesn't give us bad things. But I think what proper theological sense of what a bad thing would be is different from probably what this boy has in mind. So everything is coming up roses here. It's Santa Claus. God's all around you all the time. He believes in forgiving people and whatnot, and he's there to guide us for someone to talk to and help us through our problems. Of course, he doesn't talk back. So I'm suggesting this last statement is perhaps doubly telling. God, being distant, does not directly verbally answer prayer. So I think at one level she meant, you talk to God, but it's not like you hear a voice. But also I think that what's going on here is God does not offer any challenging comebacks or arguments to our request. God sort of gives you what you need or want. Perhaps the worst the God of moralistic therapeutic deism can do is simply to fail to provide his promised therapeutic blessings, in which case those who believe in him are entitled to be grumpy. Well, God is almighty, I guess, but I think he's on vacation now because of all the crap that's happening in the world, because it wasn't like that back when he was famous. So in other words, it's a sense like when God was actually doing his job, we didn't have so many problems. And so where is what, what's he's fallen down on the job? Or God is the overall ruler who controls everything. So like if I'm depressed or something and things aren't going my way, I blame it on him. I don't know why. Well, the obvious answer why is because the presupposition is God's job is to keep us from being depressed, is to keep everything going right. And if that's not happening, then God's falling down on the job again. 
Now, some clarifications and caveats. I'm not saying that all U.S. youth are adherents of moralistic therapeutic deism. Some youth are totally disengaged from anything religious or spiritual whatsoever. They don't have any connection to anything here. And others are very serious about their religious faith in ways that are faithful to the orthodox claims of the faith traditions they profess. So the majority are b believers and tacit de facto functional practicers of M practitioners of MTD, but not all of them. I'm also not saying that anyone's founded an official religion by the name of moralistic therapeutic theism, or that most U.S. teenagers have abandoned their religious denominations and congregations to practice MTD elsewhere or under another name. Rather, it seems that MTD has simply colonized or is colonizing many established religious traditions and congregations within the U.S., become the new, becoming the new spirit living within the old body. Its typical embrace and practice is de facto, functional, practical, and tacit, not formally, not, uh, not formally acknowledged as a distinctive religion, even though it is distinctive from what the official faith traditions that these kids belong to would say. Furthermore, I'm not suggesting that MTD is a religious faith limited teenager adherence in the U.S. To the contrary, it seems to be also widespread popular faith among many adults. Adolescents seem to be simply absorbing and reflecting religiously, probably in less mature, sophisticated forms, what the adult world is routinely modeling for and inculcating in its youth. I'm also not suggesting that MTD is a religion of teenage, that, that it, MTD is a religion that teenagers and adults either adopt or practice wholesale or not at all. It's not everything or nothing. Rather, the elements of its creed are normally assimilated by degrees, in part admixed with elements from more traditional religious faiths. Now, one way to gauge people's interest in different matters is to track their language use. And the premise is the more people talk about something, probably the more it matters to them. It's an indirect, it's a rough measure, but just focus on what people talk about. Um, so I systematically counted in the interviews the number of youth who made references to specific subjects or phrases, especially those related to historically central uh, theological and religious ideas. And so of the 267 interviews we conducted in wave one among 13 to 17 year olds, these are not the number of times things were mentioned, but the number of teens who at least once in their interview mentioned them. 47, which is the largest number of any of these, had mentioned the idea of sin. 13, obeying God. 12, religious repentance repenting from wrong doing, nine, expressing love for God, eight, righteousness, diviner. So none of the others, of, other than the nine of 267, in a two to three hour interview, focus centrally about religion and spiritual life, mentioned and mentioned love for God. You got that idea? Seven, the resurrection and rising again of Jesus. Six, giving glory to God. Six, salvation. Five, the resurrection of the dead on the last day. Five, the kingdom of God. Four, discipleship. Four, God is Trinity. Three, grace of God. So out of 267 interviews, three mention God's grace. You know what that? It's, it's just not on the radar screen. Three, the Bible is holy. Three, honoring God in life. Three, loving one's neighbor. Two, God is holy. Um, two, the justice of God. Zero, self-discipline. Zero, working for self, social justice. Zero, justification or sanctification. So there's just not a lot of uh, reference to even canned kind of Sunday school maybe answers to or language in Christian uh, theology or otherwise. For comparison, I counted uh, references to key therapeutic ideas of feeling good and being fulfilled, and they don't blow it off the map, but there are a lot more teenagers who are talking about feeling uh, happy, feeling good about themselves, about their lives, feeling satisfied, and so on. And these are not the total number of times teenagers use the word phrase, simply the number of teens who use them. The actual phrase, to feel happy, was used more than 2,000 times by the teenagers we interviewed. So that's clearly, again, this is a rough measure, but that's clearly what's on the minds of or the concerns of American teenagers. Now, 
interpretation of this. Christian talk, Jesus talk, or gospel talk is a second language. If we think about, if you think about people having a first language and a second language. My first language is English. My second language is a very little bit of Spanish. I don't have a second language. Uh, Christian talk is almost everybody's in our culture and society, unless you're clergy maybe, second language. The first language is the dominant societies, you know, capitalism, democracy, freedom, self-improvement, whatever the sort of more secular language would be the first language, and to talk about gospel or Jesus is a second language. So uh, it's a second language that very few youth, I'm saying, seem to be learning. So just like my second language is a very little bit of Spanish, for many teenagers, their second language is a very itty-bitty little bit of Christian talk. Now, you might say, well, why does talk matter? Isn't it what's going on in their hearts? What's important? So here I follow uh, the thinking of a uh, Catholic philosopher, Charles Taylor, who says, look, if something's important, it's necessary to be able to give articulation to it. It's not that everyone needs to be this sophisticated philosophical testimony giver, but the more we can express in words things, the more meaningful it becomes to us, the more we can wrap words around what's going on with us or how we see the world, the more that can become concrete and form us. So the inability to talk about things is a problem. That's my background assumption here. And so it's a problem when the second language of Christian faith becomes increasingly obsolete. Sort of like moving down from the highlands of in Peru to Lima and one's uh, uh, Quechuan language becomes displaced by Spanish and one forgets how to speak one's, what you, you know, one's second language. Now, historians will always ask when I'm giving this talk or have given this talk, is MTD anything new? I mean, isn't this just American religion from the start? Wasn't Huck Finn the ultimate moralistic therapeutic deist? Um, and this could be a long discussion. My answer is, my argument is uh, clearly MTD didn't just spring up two decades ago. It has deep roots in American individualism and American pragmatism. There's a lot of history behind this. But I think the way, I think that there is a sort of a corrosion of, um, of um, effective teaching in official religious traditions. I think American religion is being, over the long run, increasingly transformed in, into the model of consumerism, where the individual picks and chooses what they want that they feel will satisfy their needs, rather than sort of authoritative traditions forming people. And, uh, and if, for other ways, I think that youth today live in a pluralistic society and culture that exert pressures on them to get along with people who are different from them, and that moralistic therapeutic deism is a very, very comfortable and effective religious faith to practice that works well in a pluralistic environment where you have to get along. Because in the end, when I'm, if I'm correct, in the end, most teens are actually share the same religious faith. They're not saying, well, I'm Catholic and you're Jewish, and what about that? They basically have this sort of same background general beliefs that they can actually give voice to if they wanted to, and others would understand what they're talking about. So my conclusion is another popular religious faith has colonized and is colonizing many historical religious traditions. Almost without anyone noticing, MTD seems to have converted or is converting believers in old faiths to an alternative religious vision of divinely underwritten personal happiness and interpersonal niceness. I schematize this uh, by saying, look, the religion actually operates at different levels. There's individual religion, which can be idiosyncratic and eclectic, syncretistic, popular, etc. And at the very highest level, there's American civil religion of sort of like God bless America and, and a whole lot of stuff that Robert Bella has talked about. We know that there's organizational religion. That's seminaries and churches and denominations and religious summer camps, the official organized representation of religion institutionally. What I'm saying is between individual religion and organizational religion, especially for teenagers, but also for some adults, is this religion of moralistic therapeutic deism that is connected to individual religion, but it works its way up 
also the organized religion of a widely shared, largely apolitical, interreligious faith fostering subjective well-being and lubricating interpersonal relationships in the local public sphere. I mean, except for those. No, uh, no. I mean, we started off the questioning in the most widest possible. If they said, "What do you mean by religious?" Say, and whatever that might mean for you. Um, and we wouldn't even necessarily start off with God. It would be, you know, some kind of spiritual force or larger truth, or and then you sort of let them spin out whatever they have to say. Obviously, if they view God impersonally, like a force, then it wouldn't, masculine wouldn't be an issue. But for those who had a personal view of God, it's pretty much masculine. Uh, do you have any, uh, any sense of um, the experience of those who have passed from a purely MTD to a more traditional Orthodox faith, uh, what has what has helped that happen? What has what, what's been involved in people who have gone from MTD to a more serious yeah. traditional orthodox faith? Well, first of all, as background to that, um, last night I talked about emerging adulthood. In some ways, the order of this is reversed. But teenagers are pretty confident about MTD. What I observe is um, as, as teenagers move into their 20s, the MTD is still kind of the background operating religion. But for many, it becomes less certain. It becomes a little more problematic. It starts to break apart in its plausibility, partly because life just doesn't turn out this sim simple, and God just doesn't show up every time you need him to resolve. And so teenagers, through some hard knocks maybe, all, uh, some emerging, by the time they're emerging adults, they still generally have this running in the background, but it's not such a tight and confident system for them. Things have become more murky. So that, as that's a general statement. Now the question is, what about those who move out of this into a serious faith? Well, first of all, there aren't that many, at least that I came across. Um, those who, as emerging adults, tend to be orthodox, traditional, committed, serious faith and practice, probably almost certainly come from families that are like that and their families probably made sure they didn't fall too far into this to begin with. Um, <clears throat> my guess, and I don't have this amount of evidence, my guess is that those few who did, I mean, they came across some figure who were just changed, you know, some leader or some friend or somebody who said, no, that's not Christianity or that's not what you're supposed to believe. This is, and then it basically sort of knocked upside the head, so to speak, in their development to get them to think in some other way. It could be different for different types. For example, uh, a, a, you know, a, teenage, a Jewish teenager well, could be a trip to Israel, and they realize, oh, uh, and there's something about going to Israel for Jewish teenagers, or some of them, can really move, push them to a new level of seer, like, okay, what does it mean to be Jewish? And well, I've seen that, but um, maybe going to college and running into some kind of a ministry group that shows them, oh, there's a totally different way of doing this, but it's not the typical experience in any case. It's not the hard knocks in their minds that it's not the mayor every Um so uh, I talked about this last night with somebody. Hard knocks in life. So um, there are youth who have suffered hard knocks in life. A parent dies, a good friend dies, something like this. Um, it can happen that teenagers and emerging adults, when they suffer something really traumatic, it can happen that that sort of they get serious and try to figure things out more seriously. But in general, I would say the effect of that 
there's a certain kind of sobering effect of like, ooh, not everything is easy and sweet in life. But to be sobered up doesn't necessarily mean to clarify the truth. It could just mean to spend more time being introspective and wrestling with hard things. It doesn't necessarily mean getting somewhere with the wrestling. And for some teenagers, um, hard knocks can push them in a, in a nihilistic direction of like, oh, it, not, it's all just, you know, just to eat, drink, and be merry sort of thing, or just complete confusion or complete anger. So not, it doesn't guarantee any particular outcome necessarily. Um, especially if they don't have a functional mentor, someone to help them interpret the meaning of the difficult things in life. It's a displacement of the poli it's a political by virtue of displacing political interest. Yes. Right. Um, yeah. Okay. I could see that. I mean, we could talk probably much much greater length as to that vacuum, uh, politically speaking, um, in our culture. What fills the vacuum generally is disinterest or despair that the larger social world can be improved and therefore a determination to just personally be happy and succeed. So, so are you saying another expression of the privatized individualism? political in the negative sense, in the sense of absence. Yes. science, like what science has done to make life easier or solve health problems and so on. I don't see anything in where that sort of discourages young people from being more religiously committed in a direct and obvious sense. In the sense that I talked last night, you were here last night, right? In the sense that I talked last night where, and this is not science, but this is a cultural construction of science and religion. Young people do assume that science and religion are at odds and science has the truth and religion doesn't and so that that framing of things has the clear effect of corroding the ability to take religion very seriously because they do take science seriously um, in a more in a more general it depends on your th all right so there are different theories of religion how religion works and why people are drawn to religion one um, theory uh, is uh, called uh, existential security theory, and that is um, the less secure people feel in life that something could happen to them, that they're vulnerable, they could die, they could get a disease, the more people are religious. And the more people feel like, I'm going to live a long time, I'm, gonna, I'm healthy, I've got my retirement savings, 
they're existentially secure, then they don't feel the need for religion. I have mixed feelings about that theory, but um, some people believe it. And so, that in a more broad sense, if science has helped to create a world in which we feel pretty self-sufficient and comfortable, as opposed to not too long ago when life expectancy was a lot shorter and people got diseases and died in a couple days that seemed healthy and so on. Um, it could be that that kind of experience makes people less interested, felt need to rely on God for anything. I don't think that's what you were really asking though. So uh, I don't see any direct sense of I think, I think young people and most people compartmentalize. Well, science does what it does, technology does what it does, and God is about something else. because it's more essential to them and something they care about. Most likely those teens are Mormon, Evangelical, or Black Protestant. Um, and that kind of language is more suited to their traditions, but also they're just more likely to be committed and interested, in, and then yes, then you could have a more in-depth conversation. Uh, Dr. Sam? for better or worse yeah. is the proper way to put it, yeah. So right. anyway, if, if you have Yeah, um, I don't know about that research, so I can't say about it. I'd have to see, you know, a lot of methodology and so on. Um, I can say that for, a, for many youth, the quality of their youth group is an important part of their spiritual formation. So uh, I'd be the last person to say youth groups are irrelevant or a problem. Um, but there's a lot of variance in what youth groups are. And my guess is the kind that that study is referring to, if they're big and snazzy, they're probably very or oriented toward entertainment. And so that's going to select on people that want to be entertained. And then when they're 20-something, church isn't going to be entertaining anymore. So that would be my guess about what's going on there. Of course, there can be youth groups of all different sizes. And much has to do with the vision and commitment of the leadership, how, what kind of engagement that goes on, the kind of personal relationships it built, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's all very complicated. But uh, so youth group, I think, is important as one piece of a larger package of forming young people. It's not the most important piece. It just isn't. And again, parents are them. I should also say, I didn't say this explicitly last night about parents. It's not just parents, boom. It's parents um, who have a good relationship with their children. If parents are seriously religious and have a crappy relationship with their kids, then that will kind of push their kids away. So it's the, an interaction of 
strongly religious parents and quality relationship. It also matters if dad is invested in this and not just mom. So the, the bigger effect is the father than the mother. Mothers are often thought of as, well, she's just doing her job if she goes takes us to church. Whereas if a father goes to church, that really sends a signal in this culture to children like, okay, my parents have a united front and even a male cares about this and loves Jesus or whatever. So that's another factor. And then family structure matters um, for various reasons. It just is the case. Two biological parents who are intact raising kids are going to raise the more religious kids. Single parents, their kids may be religious, but they're going to be less so, probabilistically, for various reasons. I mean, uh, that's not to judge divorce, you know, single parents at all, but it's just sociologically. So I don't want to come across like, all you need is strong parents and that's it. It's really complex. There are different things going on. But back to your main point, um, it's tr there's a very tricky, it's very tricky business how to navigate making faith, show, allowing the, the beauty and power of faith to shine forth to people so they find it attractive without turning that into consumerist entertainment. Especially in a culture where, say, the Catholic faith is actually very quite countercultural to very many sensibilities. Yeah, so uh, girls are always somewhat more religious than guys. Not dramatically, but somewhat. And they're always significantly more. And this is a universal. Any religion, any age group, any place in the world, women are more religious, whatever the religion. So this is a fascinating sociological puzzle. Why is that the case? And sociologists fight about it and argue and have different theories. There's multiple theories, but uh, I'm not sure I'm convinced of any of them, but it is a very strong pattern. So boys are always, in our culture and in my study, boys are always somewhat less, significantly less, you know, by an order of 10 to 15 percent on anything. Less praying, going to church, faith is important, whatever, than girls. There are individual men who are, but as a group of male, female, no. Mm -mm. But from what I can discern from everything they've all, anyone has ever said in our study, there would be a general uh, disposition to feel very friendly toward um, Francis and to like what he's having to say. They may completely misunderstand what he's intending to say, but, they, but from what they hear through the media, there will be a friendliness toward that, a happiness to hear. You know, here's somebody who's more authentic, he's more forgiving, he's more human somehow will feel to many young people. Um, yeah. It doesn't mean they're necessarily going to start going to mass more. <laughs> Um, not only was there a contain, so no, I didn't get any sort of, I wish I had something more, no. And it wasn't even like, I'm content with this, it was, this is just what it is. And this is just obvious. It's not even like, this is my version, this is what I'm working with, it's just, this is water to fish. No, not seeking. 
I had a slide about no spiritual seeking. I cut it out for the sake of time, but there's... I was wondering if it was more evangelical outreach to these people. Would that, what kind of effect would you think that would have? If people went to them trying to give them more, more traditional religious beliefs and a stronger religious faith... Some would respond positively and others would say, mm, not be sure. I mean, I think it, for starters, it'd be just good for them to know. You may believe that, but that's not Christianity. Just to sort of get the facts straight, and then they might start thinking, "Oh, well, what am I?" But that may not have any effect either. But there's a general. I mean, as long MTD isn't too bad, and if it seems to work for you, why, why you know, why mess with it, so to speak? Um, and part of what you're asking indirectly is how do you get how do you get beyond it? How do you challenge things? I don't entirely know. Um, but I, again, I always go back to parents. I mean, where is this coming from? I'm not saying parents are inculcating. This stuff is really insidious. In a way. Lost generations that we have to start over the training the next one. I think if something like that is true, it's probably more true in the Catholic Church than in some other churches. I don't, I don't have it all figured out, I don't, but that's my sense. Um, but I don't know how to get to the next generation either. Um, yeah. Um, commenting on the parents, did you find a correlation that the parents were kind of saying the same thing? Those that were asked to so we, we did a 30 minute survey with the parents, but we didn't interview parents. So the, I don't have a research design to be able to do that. They say I've interviewed a lot of adults yeah. before and after this, and especially after, I would just be sitting there thinking, you're just telling me MTD. You're all up and down and every which way right now. So yeah, I mean, it's clearly out there among adults. I can't the validate that. There's a correlation between the parent and... I can tell you, here's a story that I find really interesting about the insidiousness of this. And that it, So there's an evangelical, white evangelical church in South Bend. All the leaders read, my, read this book, Soul Searching, were completely appalled by MTD, and they were determined to do something different. And we did a year-long study of uh, ethnography of their youth group and their youth leaders and told, you know, I mean, he knows all this. So they're out to get, make sure MTG doesn't happen there. But we spent a year sort of hanging out, listening, taking field notes and so on. And one of the things we concluded was that youth group is incredibly effective at promoting MTD, even though they're totally against it. It's because they're trying to bring in kids, they're trying to not just have kids of the leaders of the, of the members of the church, they're trying to bring in kids from high school, and they're trying to make the faith attractive, and they're trying to, so they do things like break down into small groups and share your what's going on in your life and pray for each other. Or, um, the, you know, the leader is sort of charismatic guy is uh, talking about all Jesus will do for you and so. But even so, this this is the amazing thing about sociology. It shows us all these unintended effects. Everyone's trying to do X, it turns out to be A instead. So it's very hard. It's very hard to not fall into this. His, uh, just to entertain you, his, one of my, I had a grad student that completely freaked out and was thinking of dropping out of the program after one of his, well, she was sort of, he was giving a talk on Esther, and this was to show how sort of cool God is and the Bible is, and he just kept referring to how um, sexy Esther was, like over and over and over. I mean, this is all sort of sexist stuff going on here, but this, so I think the title of his talk was Hot for Jesus. <laughs> So, where the breakdown is exactly, you know, I don't know, but uh, there's the general assumption when you're dealing with youth, you're competing against everything else that's entertaining, and so you either need to be really entertaining or you're going to lose. It's just, it's a hard, hard thing. And in our parishes and in our schools, 
going on, and a lot of people know this, but uh, for a very long time, American Catholicism sort of relied on a certain set of sociological facts about how it was put together that made it function. Strongly ethnic, urban, certain social class, geographically dense, um, somewhat persecuted or or not accepted, uh, its own separate school system available. All these things made this made Catholicism work in a certain collective way that didn't require as much sort of intentionality and modeling and teaching and da 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 da. It was a certain way of life. Not to say rosy or anything, but I just think sociologically it was some. And in the mid 20th century, a lot of social changes within Catholicism knocked the blocks out, on, out from under a lot of that. So Catholics are kind of structurally in the same position as Protestants, sort of upper middle class, living in the suburbs, driving everywhere, da 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 da. And, but without having come up with an alternative pedagogical and formation approach to shaping individuals that, say, evangelicals have. Um, so it's sort of like, wait a minute, every, all the support structures that used to make us work like went away and we now we're just kind of standing out here naked in the field, so to speak, with regard to how to pass on faith to children, not having figured out yet a replacement model. I mean, that's one way to think about that. The other is, it, it's, it, use the word countercultural. It's interesting to think about Catholic, American Catholic as countercultural or not countercultural. American Catholics have never been countercultural. In the, they've, always, they've for a long time been marginal or excluded, but that's different from countercultural. And part of my observation in Notre Dame, for example, is that has made a lot of American Catholics be falling, falling all over themselves to try to prove to the rest of America, we're good Democrats, we're good Americans, we're good in the military, we're good, wave the flag, it's, so to try, try to show we're not different from other people. We're just as good Americans as you all. And, you know, God, country, Notre Dame. I mean, it's a certain thing there. And so, um, and the deeper history of Catholicism is Christendom. So, like, well, okay, a long time ago we were persecuted, but we've since been running Europe, I mean, running Christendom. And so there isn't, if compared to, say, if you're a Mennonite, You've been had, your relatives are all you know drowned and burned at the stake, and you understand who you are by being in, in distinction from the dominant. 
I don't think that's much in the Catholic DNA to think in these sort of countercultural terms, and yet Catholicism is becoming more countercultural, not because it's changing, because the world around it is changing, and it's just, you know, it's, forget abortion, homosexuality. Just think about, oh, I pray to saints, and I mean, all the. It's a sacra. It's a. It's a an enchanted world that Catholics live in. That's not mainstream culture. And so I think part of what Catholicism has got to figure out is how to be mainstream, how to not be sectarian, how to not just be swept along with wherever the mainstream is going, et cetera, et cetera. I, mean, I just think these are pieces of the puzzle that have to be figured out. I haven't seen a lot of that kind of cultish stuff happening. It does, but I haven't seen a lot of it. Um, I mean, the best way to avoid that is to stay in the structure of the Catholic Church, basically. I mean, that would be my... I mean, it's one of the beauties of Catholicism, is there's ways to deal with these things, as opposed to Protestants can just continually... I can say this, I can say this because I used to be Protestant, but can just continually be factionally created in a new schism and a new sect or whatever. Um, your first question, I mean, I'm not the best person to answer that. There are a lot of people out and about thinking about these things. The National Federation of Catholic Youth Ministries is a great is a great program that a lot of people have formed called Strong Catholic Families. It's a direct response to try to figure out what to do in light of NSYR findings. Um, but I can't Another thought is, it seems to me that young people need to be evangelized before they are, can be catechized. I mean, a, in some sense, m one of the messages of my research is, we'll start teaching some substance. And give them something, like if they're going to reject God, at least make sure it's the true God they're rejecting and not some fancy of their imagination. Um, so I do think there's a big, an importance of teaching, but I think there's an there's a need to sort of get young people, I don't have this all figured out, but it seems to me there's a need to sort of prepare them to be taught. They're not in, even in the place to be effectively taught. It's just somehow they need to be destabilized from all their current assumptions and, and be opened up in new ways to hear some new things. That's really vague, I understand. <laughs> Yeah, and that could be one metaphor for it. I'm not exactly sure. The other would be to give them shock treatment to get them out of there. <laughs> I mean, one of the things that I, I, I mean, I'm not in the business of recommending as a sociologist, but I, if, it, if I were, in the, say, attack moralism wherever you see it. Whenever you hear a young person think, Christianity is just be a nice person, blow that up. Right. By churches, 
appealing to youth culture and holding on to youth as a result. Others say, no, we're not just that. We're going to blow it up. We're going to, we've got to do this. And win. And so there, there seems to be this terrible choice. That's yeah. Um, yeah, there are real dilemmas to figure out how to try to remain something like faithful in this culture and society. And when um, mass consumer capitalism has powerful influences on people's understanding of themselves and what life is about. I'm not a communist. I'm, I'm, happy, I'm a happy capitalist. But I can also observe mass consumer capitalism of a certain kind with advertising, etc., forms people in certain ways. That's a problem for Christian faith. Um, I don't entirely know. I mean, I think that re what's required is to figure out where to be distinctive, where one has got to take a stand in being distinctive. Um, People aren't going to be attracted to the same old, but people are also not going to be attracted to something really way out there. So that sounds like pragmati pragma pragmatic str strategy talk, but um, I think there's a, ne a lot of need to sort of sort through where to put the stakes down and where to sort of adjust to things. And um, I'm not sure that, no, I won't say that. Um, it's a huge challenge, and it's because the world is changing. On the other hand, um, I don't mean this in a dismissive or smug way, but on the other hand, if the gospel is true, then the church will survive, and um, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> Thank you.